Okay, so um, welcome to the second module of the Bread Open Course on Development Economics. Um, I hope you found the first module informative and, and interesting. Um, and I think we've got a, a great set of lectures for you uh, on credit insurance and risk. Uh, I'll be starting off and, and then you'll be hearing from Abhijit Banerjee, Emily Breza, Lorenzo Casaburi, Pascaline Dupa, and Tavneet Suri. Um, so I'm going to get us. I'm going to get us started off uh, talking about the foundations of risk sharing, uh, just to uh, provide a, a theoretical and uh, the beginnings of an empirical understanding of this this larger topic. Uh, so this is this is going to be mostly a, a lecture format. I'll stop periodically uh, four or five times during this hour and a half to ask you. Um, for questions and uh, give us a chance to talk a little bit. Um, okay, so, so we're off. Um, so risk, risk is ubiquitous and it's potent in the lives of people in developing countries. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, the magnitudes, the, the median coefficient of variation over time of household income in the United States is about 0.3, so the standard deviation is about 0.3 of the mean. Um, for non-farm enterprises in Sri Lanka, for example, their, their coefficient of variation of, of, of their quarterly profits is about 0.5, so almost twice as much as what we see in, in the United States. In agriculture, the coefficient of variation of farm profits over time in uh, Maharashtra and Andhra Pradesh, in a set of villages that ICRASAT, the International Crop Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, surveyed over a long period of time, their coefficient of variation of, over time and their farm profits was 1.4. And in Northern Ghana, where I've been doing a lot of work, the CV over time for an individual's farm profits was almost four. So the magnitudes of risk can be really, really large. And a given magnitude of risk matters more if you're poor. Think of it as, as uh, uh, stepping into into a, a into a body of water. If if you're if you're covered if you in your, if you're knee deep in the water, the waves aren't going to matter very much to you. But if you're already up to your neck in the water, that same degree of of waviness matters a lot more. Um, so risk has to be something that the that poor individuals are thinking about all the time. We'll find it useful to think about risks of different forms and different, different, different uh, types. Um, we, can, we can create a typology by thinking about the scale of the risk, the, the, that is the, 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 the scope of people who are affected by it, and the duration of the risk. So for example, a localized pest infestation on, on one of your farms um, might, is, is, might, might affect just you, and it might be temporary. It might just mess up your farm profits for, for that season. Um, on the other hand, something that affects you individually but lasts for a long time, like a disability, um, will pose different challenges for, for addressing. Uh, a, a drought would be an example of a risk that is transitory. It's not gonna last forever, but it's aggregate. It's affecting many people at the same time. And climate change would be an example of a risk that's affecting everybody and is permanent. So these different scales and durations of, of, of risk are going to have very different implications for how people deal with them and how it affects their lives. So people face multiple risks of different scales, and different degrees of permanence. And the choices, especially of the poor, are shaped by both the prospect of those, rich, those risks and by their realization. And so economists and other scholars have found a vast array of institutions that play an important role or seem to play an important role in addressing the consequences of risk. <clears throat> 
so again, another typology might be to think about how different institutions and different behaviors are used to help people deal with risk. And one, one way of categorizing these different responses to risk is along the dimension of whether you're responding, you're responding in terms of your consumption or in terms of the income or production side of your lives. And another dimension would be whether you're taking these actions before risk is realized or after. So for example, we see sharecropping as a, as a common form of, of, of obtaining access to land in, in many economies. And one of the consequences of a sharecropping, a sharecropping contract in which the tenant repay, pays the landlord for the uh, use of the land in terms of a share of the tenant's output is that the landlord is taking on some of the risk faced by the tenant that the tenant would face in say a fixed rent contract. Um, and so this is an, a, a contract that's, that's arranged in advance. So it's an ex ante response to risk and it's on the income or production side of, of the um, tenant's life. There's lots of other um, activities in this same category. For example, your asset allocation, diversification, it's an ex ante way of, of addressing the, the possibility of, of bad outcomes of risk. Irrigation, one of the, one of the um, consequences of irrigation is it helps separate your production from rainfall fluctuations. Occupational diversification, like asset allocation, can serve to diversify an individual or a household's income stream um, and, thereby, and therefore avoid some other risks. And we can, we can fill in the boxes of this um, two, by two, two by two categorization um, with, with a variety of other institutions and behaviors that we, we find um, throughout the world and particularly in developing countries. So for example, precautionary saving is an ex ante mechanism of adjusting your consumption to deal with the prospect of risk. Of risk. Similarly, network formation, um, investing in relationships that can later on be used to help you deal with consequences of shocks and, and other forms of risk um, can be thought of as an ex ante mechanism on the consumption side that you're taking to deal with the prospect of risk. Ex post on the income side, um, there's this uh, people respond to shocks to their uh, productivity or to their wages or to their incomes by adjusting their labor supply, by migrating. Um, and on uh, technical adjustments in production. So for example, if you have uh, a bad rainfall outcome, you might uh, adjust the timing of your harvest or adjust your application of certain uh, inputs. And then on the consumption ex post side, there's leisure demand. That's, that's the analog to labor supply. When you have a bad shock, you have to reduce consumption. One of the things you reduce is leisure. You might borrow, lend, save, or dissave. And this is gonna be a major focus of our uh, module in, the, in about two weeks is how do people deal with savings and borrow, uh, savings and dissavings when they're dealing with risk. And tomorrow, Abhijit Banerjee will talk about the credit market and, and the roles it can play in dealing with risk. But today, we're gonna focus mostly on transfers and informal insurance, that is, how do communities uh, who are dealing with risk and dealing with shocks, how can they optimally help each other out? How can, how can risk be allocated informally within communities? So financial markets, insurance, credit, savings, permit households to move resources over time or across states of nature. 
So insurance takes place across households within communities or within economies. And so resources are being transferred through insurance between households or individuals who have uh, good shocks and households who have, bad, have experienced bad shocks at the same time. Savings and credit transactions are moving resources over time. What we wanna talk about today are what are the theoretical limits to insurance and saving and borrowing? And what are the constrained optimal responses to these limits? So what limits our ability to, to deal with risk through these financial transactions? And what are the constrained optimal responses to those limits? And are the actual insurance arrangements and patterns of savings and borrowing, are the, the actual transactions we observe consistent with this theory? And how do existing informal financial markets interact with the expansion of formal financial systems? How do they interact? Um, so these are, the, these are the questions that we're going to try to deal with uh, start, starting today. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a pause, see if there's any questions, um, any, anything that needs to be clarified yet uh, before I go on to start talking in more detail about risk and informal insurance within within villages. So we don't currently have any questions, okay. but this is a good point to remind students, if you do want to ask something, just put it in the Q&A box. Okay, great. So trying to understand the um, organization of, of villages in rural developing countries um, and how the financial arrangements that we see in villages help people deal with risk is an example of a sustained research program spanning many researchers over many papers. Um, it, it, it really illustrates, I think, uh, an, an exciting um, dimension of, of economics in which we see theory playing a really important role, motivated by observations um, that are formal or informal. Um, and these two interacting with the construction of empirical tests of, that, of those theories um, that then motivate us to look for other clues and to develop new theories. Within this broad literature, risk sharing has been the occasion of very interesting interactions between theory and empirical work. So let's take a simple null hypothesis. Uh, let's, let's, let's start with a simple set of observations. Um, there's a vast array of apparent risk-sharing institutions. This can be drawn from accounts of medieval villages in Europe, contemporary rural communities in developing countries, um, uh, ethnographic accounts, conversations with people. Um, uh, for me, my, my work on this was really sparked by, by um, conversations with, with farmers in, in Northern Nigeria, where they were telling me about, about the, the risk sharing components of uh, activities that I didn't understand. Um, so a simple null hypothesis is that maybe these risk sharing institutions work. Maybe they permit uh, individuals within rural communities to efficiently share risk. This, was proposed by Robert Townsend in his seminal paper in 1994, Econometrica, Risk and Insurance in Village India. The theory was that, that through, through, the, through the combination of institutions that exist in uh, villages in India, households within these communities achieve an efficient allocation of insurance. He derives in that paper the empirical implications of achieving efficient insurance. He, he describes precisely how much consumption smoothing we would expect to see in a Pareto efficient village economy. Then he uses panel data on consumption and income from three villages in Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra. Some of the, these three include, are, are, are some of the villages that I mentioned in the very first slide. 
Um, so um, let me just praise ICRASAT, the International Crop Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, for playing a really important role in, in shaping uh, the field of economics by collecting extraordinarily detailed and rich uh, long-term data following households and individuals within households over a decade uh, in a number of villages in uh, India and actually in Burkina Faso, which we'll hear about later. Um, this kind of long-term sustained data collection with tight connections between the data collectors, the enumerators, and the communities in which they lived um, really reveals a, a lot that can't be seen um, in shorter surveys or, or, or broader surveys. These kind of detailed in-depth um, dives into how particular communities are organized are really valuable. Um, so Townsend uses data from this um, long-term empirical effort from Microsat to show that in fact, there does appear to be a lot of insurance within these communities, but they're just not, they do not achieve a fully efficient allocation of risk. Here's the, here's the basic story that Townsend finds. Here's a picture of the co-movement of household incomes in one village over a decade. And so each of these lines is the time path of income of an individual household. And so what do you see in this picture? You see a mountain range. You see some people's income going up, other people's income going down. It's jagged. There's a lot of there's a lot of variation. Um, and then if you take a look at the time path for the same households over the same years in their consumption, this is of, their, of grain consumption only, what we see is a lot smoother path and a lot more co-movement. There's a lot less idiosyncratic variation than we see in the incomes. Okay. So those two pictures are what motivated Townsend to write down a model of the efficient allocation of risk within a village economy. And so what we get to do now is understand what that means. What is full insurance? What is the Pareto efficient allocation of risk? Um, so let's, let's write down the definition of Pareto efficiency. Okay. Pareto efficiency means an, 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 an allocation is Pareto efficient if it's not possible to change that, uh, to reallocate resources, to reallocate, to, if we can't find another allocation that makes everybody in an economy better off with the same resources. So we can't, real, we can't reallocate, uh, consumption or production across individuals within this economy in such a way that we make everybody better off. Okay, so how do we write that mathematically? Well, first we define a set of people, N, that are our economy. Um, and so here, uh, Townsend's gonna take the population of the village as, as the, the, the economy he's looking at. And so there's gonna be N people, uh, one through N, each of them has got preferences over consumption. And so here is uh, person N, well, we'll actually call it household N, the, the nth household who gets utility from some allocation of consumption. So C N is just gonna be a vector of real numbers um, where C is the value of consumption. Um, C N S T is gonna be the value of consumption of household N in state S at time T. Um, so CN is just that vector of consumptions that are, that are state and time specific. It's gonna be S states of nature. The S states of nature are defined in this economy by just a, um, a, an income draw for each individual in the economy for that state for that period. So there's M possible levels of income and a state is defined by uh, a set of incomes that is individual state time specific. 
So um, a Pareto efficient allocation is one that maximizes the utility of one person. Here we've just arbitrarily taken person N, subject to the utility of everybody else has got to be at least as high as some given level for that individual. And the total amount of consumption in any state and any time has got to be less than or equal to the total income that's available in that state and that time. And nobody's consumption can be negative. Okay, so the definition of Pareto efficiency is that any Pareto efficient allocation of, in this case, consumptions can be characterized as the solution to this problem for some set of utilities that we promise to everybody, every individual. So um, one Pareto efficient allocation would be everybody else has really low utilities and I have person N gets a really high utility. That would define one Pareto efficient allocation. Another Pareto efficient allocation would be giving more utility to many of the people um, and then person N will get less utility. Okay, so by, by, by appropriate choice of the levels of utility that everybody else gets, we can map out the whole set of Pareto efficient allocations within this economy. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask you guys questions. Um, you don't have to answer, but I just wanna make sure everybody's on, on, on track with us. So um, just to say, let me just, let me just revise what this problem is. So I'm gonna choose an allocation of consumptions for every individual in every state in every period, such that I'm maximizing the utility of person N, which depends upon all the consumptions that I allocate to person N, subject to the constraints that the utility of person I, given the consumptions that I allocate to her, is greater than or equal to some uh, uh, baseline level. And this total amount of consumption that I allocate to all the people in my economy is less than the total amount of income that I allocate, that, that I have available to me in this state and this time, for every state and time. Okay. Um, so, okay. How many constraints do we have here? Okay. So, count in your head the number of constraints. How many constraints are here? And how many constraints are here? You should be able to answer both those questions. Um, in fact, I'll take questions now as we go along. Um, um, second, this lambda i is going to be the um, Lagrange multiplier associated with the constraint for individual i's utility, okay? Pi st is gonna be the Lagrange multiplier associated with the village level resource constraint in state s at period t. These Lagrange multipliers are gonna play an important role in, the, in a few minutes. So um, what do they mean? Suppose I um, increase the utility uh, constraint for, for household I by one level, by one. What does that, what does lambda I imply? Okay. All right. So hopefully you guys can all answer those questions. So now I'll answer them. There's N minus one constraints here. So these are the, the there are n minus one equations, one for each of the n minus one people in the village other than person n. And there's uh, capital S times capital T resource constraints here. That's the number for each state, for each period, there's a resource cons constraint, okay? Um, the meaning of lambda i is this tells you how much person n's utility can be increased, will do actually how much person N's utility will decrease if I increase person I's utility by one. Pi ST similarly tells me how much 
person one's utility will increase if we increase the availability of resources in state asset time t by one. Okay, what does this set of equations imply about the possibilities of savings and borrowing in this economy? Okay. So the answer to that is that we've assumed that there's no savings and no borrowing. We've, we're, we're, we're constraining our, consum our aggregate consumption within the village to be less than our aggregate income in our village in every state, in every period. So the village as a whole is neither borrowing nor lending to anybody else. What have we assumed about production? Here, there's no production. This is an endowment economy. We're just randomly giving people income. They're not working. They're not working. They're not, um, there's no labor leisure trade-off. Those are actually relatively inessential to the main message of this, of this model. We could easily add production to it. Okay, and what have we assumed about preferences? What have we assumed about preferences? Um, well, one thing we've assumed is that the utility of person of, of household N only depends upon the consumption of household N. The utility of household I only depends upon the consumption of household I. So there, people are selfish or households are selfish. Okay. We've also assumed that there's only one good in each state in each period. So C, I, S, T, there's just one good. We could easily modify this to make it a vector of goods, but we're not going to now. Um, we've also assumed that um, I can interchange the words household and individual. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm gonna, Townsend's gonna be using data on, on households and we're writing down utility functions as though there was just one set of preferences for that household. So we're, we're not gonna deal with any things about intra-household resource allocation, uh, gender differences and preferences, um, kids versus adults consumption, anything like that. It's just gonna be, a, we're gonna treat the household as though they were an individual. Okay. And finally, what have we assumed about the community, um, about the economy? Um, we've, we started off by assuming that these, N individuals form the relevant economic unit in, un, in which risk is being allocated efficiently. Um, Townsend's gonna just translate that into a village. Um, that may not be appropriate. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so the implications of this model are very straightforward. Just think about what the first order conditions of this problem are. Just Let's just, let's just do the maximization. Um, what has to be true for the optimal level of any, uh, any CIST, consumption for household I and state S at time T? Well, if that's CIST um, is, is not person N, that only shows up here in the problem and here in the problem. And so what we're gonna get is here, it's gonna be multiplied by the Lagrange multiplier for the constraint for person I, and here it's gonna be multiplied by the Lagrange multiplier for the, the resource constraint for state S in period T. And so we're gonna have lambda J, the Lagrange multiplier for household J times the marginal utility of consumption for household J in that state in that period has to be equal to the uh, the margin, the, the Lagrange multiplier for the resource constraint for state S at time T. Okay. Um, and that is going to be, a, we're going to see the same equation for the allocation of consumption to household I in state S at time T. So the marginal utility of consumption of person J times her Pareto weight lambda j is gonna be equal to pi st and the same for, for household i. So if we take ratios of this, we can look at it one of two ways that, that each yields insight. So the ratio of the marginal utility of um, person i in state s at time t 
to the marginal utility of person J at, in state S of time T is just equal to the ratio of their Pareto weights. Okay, that is lambda J and lambda I, which are the um, marginal costs of increasing the utility of person I and person J in terms of the utility of person N. So these lambdas um, reflect the value that the Pareto program is placing on that person. That is, if you've got a very high lambda J, that means that um, your, the, the Pareto weight is, is giving you a, a lot of weight in the program, okay? And so, the marginal utility of consumption of person I in the state relative to the marginal utility of person J in the state is equal to the inverse of the ratio of their Pareto weights. The person who has the higher Pareto weight is gonna have the lower marginal utility. It's gonna have, sorry, uh, uh, it's gonna have the lower marginal utility because they're consuming more. And so this could be a direct relationship between your Pareto weight and how much you consume. And what's interesting is that this ratio of marginal utilities in state S at time T of person I to person J is fixed by their Pareto weights. Their Pareto weights don't have an S or a T subscript. They're just individual subscript, which means that the ratio of marginal utilities of any two people cannot change over time. And that's the key implication of an efficient allocation of risk. We can see it by, as well, by looking at the uh, relationship between the marginal utility of consumption of person I in state S at time T to the marginal utility of consumption of the same person in a different state at a different time. That ratio, the ratio across states or across time of an individual's marginal utility is determined solely by the ratio of the the Grange multiplier on the village resource constraint in those two states and times. That is, this is this does not have any I subscript. That is, the, the, the ratio of marginal utilities of my consumption in two different states and times depends only on aggregate village resources. It doesn't depend upon anything about me. So this has those, these two ratios have a striking empirical implication, which is that the consumption of any individual at any state in any time in a Pareto efficient allocation of risk within a, an economy depends only on an individual specific function of the um, value of resources to the economy as a whole. And this is going to be downward sloping. That is, as the as the value of resources in the village get higher, my consumption must monotonically decline. Okay, All right. So these, these, are the, these are the fundamental implications of Pareto efficient allocations of risk in an economy um, that has, that, has um, that, that, that fully shares risk. And um, the, these are essentially all the empirical implications. Everything else is gonna be assumptions that we make on, on preferences to make this more empirically tractable. The only really controversial assumption that's, that's made up to this point is that individual utilities depend only on their own consumption. They're not caring about anybody else. Um, that, that would, that caring would change these results in an important way. Okay, now Townsend in his original article and others since make additional assumptions on preferences to add more structure. Oh, I had another question for you on this program. This is, a, this is all about the allocation of risk across people within a village over time and how um, how to characterize the efficient allocation of risk. And yet nowhere in this program do I see 
the probabilities of states occur. That is, you know, I, I don't see anything in this in this math that talks about either the discount rate, that is, you know, how, how much I value future consumption relative to, to current consumption, or the probability of these different states occurring. You know, there's 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 this randomness happening. Some people are getting high incomes, some people are getting low incomes. There's all these probabilities, there should be probabilities here. Where are they? You know, shouldn't, shouldn't the allocation change if the probability of state S prime is really low versus really high? Um, so where are the probabilities? Okay, you don't have to answer me that, but you should be able to, it, it should occur to you where they are. They're in the preferences, okay? The probabilities are embedded in these, in these preferences. What I've written down here is just a very general uh, utility function, which says that my utility depends upon my consumption vector, um, which is a vector of all the consumptions I get in each state and each time. And so we're now gonna make assumptions about those preferences. And so here's one way of, uh, of making this general preferences more specific. So for example, we might assume that it's time separable. So that's what we're doing here. We're gonna now say that my utility from a, a vector of consumptions at different states and different times, is just gonna be a discounted sum of future utilities. So that's the, that's the, the time separability of my preferences. And we're gonna be exponentially discounting. Um, and we might say that we're getting expected utility. And so that's what this is doing. This is taking, um, we're summing over states, waiting by the probability of the state occurring. So this is now expected utility maximization. Here's the probability of state S, and here's my utility in given the consumption that I get in state S of time T. And so this is a very familiar um, functional form for utility in an uncertain environment over time. Okay. And then you might make even more structure, like assume that you've got constant absolute risk aversion which now gives you a specific functional form for UI. Instead of just having a general concave preferences, um, a concave utility function over consumption, we're now gonna specialize it and say, we've got constant absolute risk aversion or constant relative risk aversion if you want it, or some other uh, particular functional form. So here's a specific functional form. And so if you make all of these assumptions, we now, can write down exactly what the marginal utility of consumption is for person I. It's this, okay. So we can take our we can take our general um, empirical implications of an efficient allocation of risk, and we can specialize it. We can say if the preferences look like this, then an efficient allocation of risk must mean that the ratio of the marginal utility of person I in state S at time T to the marginal utility of person J in state S at time T is just equal to this. And then the delta T's cancel out, the probability of the states cancel out, and we're left with just this, E to the sigma CJST minus sigma CIST are gonna be equal to the ratio of our Pareto weights. And so we're left with just this. So if we take logs, we're left with this. That is, the difference between person J's consumption and person I's consumption is just fixed at the difference between their Pareto weights. Okay. So let's just do a little bit more algebra. Let's let's just let's just solve this for C I S T, and we've got this. Okay. Now. We have, this is true for CIST against any other person in that. I, person J could be anybody in that village. So let's sum this. We've got, we've got N of these equations for CIST equals CJST, CIST equals CKST, CLST, and so on. It's, this is true for every household in the village. And so if, if we sum these up across those N households, and then divide by n, we're left with this equation, which is the key equation that Townsend 
um, is going to test um, for the efficient allocation of risk. And what does it say? What it says is that my consumption in state asset times T is equal to average village consumption in state asset times T plus some fixed number that is, depends on the relationship between my Pareto weight in that first program minus the average village Pareto weight. So what that means is all idiosyncratic risk is pooled. My consumption is just moving one for one with village consumption. If, if everybody in the village consumes one more unit of food this, this, this year, I consume one more unit of food. Everybody's village, everybody's consumption is moving in lockstep with each other, okay? So it's a really strong implication of the efficient allocation of risk, okay? And so in particular, what that means is that my consumption in state S and period T does not depend on my income, okay? My consumption in, my consumption in period T in data, if I look at the actual data, my consumption is gonna, it's gonna vary over time. I'm gonna have a, an individual fixed effect, alpha I. Alpha I is going to be equal to this thing, which is telling me the weight of my, uh, you know, how important am I in the Pareto program? Who, I'm, am, I, am I somebody who's privileged? I have a high lambda. Or am I somebody who's, who's impoverished? I have a low lambda. That's, that's gonna be a fixed number. There's no T or S in this, it's a fixed number. And so that's alpha I um, plus beta times the con average consumption in the village. Beta should be equal to one. My consumption is just equal to average village consumption plus a constant. But what's important is that my consumption should not depend upon my income conditional on average village consumption. What we see here is that my consumption just depends on the average village consumption. My income has got nothing to do with my consumption and the efficient allocation of risk. Okay. And so the exclusion restriction is that conditional on average village consumption, my own idiosyncratic income should not matter for my consumption. So that's the testable restriction that comes out of Townsend's model. And here's just a, a, a quick glimpse at some of his results. Let's look at column A. Um, what, what, what he's finding is that these are, the, these are reporting this coefficient, the coefficient on zeta. Um, what he's finding is that in each of the three villages, there is a correlation between the individual's income, the household's income, and household's consumption, but it's small only about uh, 5 percent, 5 to 7 percent of the variation in individual income is translating into uh, individual consumption. And so Townsend's response to this is that the, 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 the consumption of individual households does respond to individual income, but not by much. Okay, I'll stop here for some questions if there are any. Okay, we have a few questions. Uh, the okay. first one is from He Sing Kim. How can we empirically determine the effects of insurance on consumption smoothing in rural villages separate from other factors? Okay, excellent. So that's, um, let me answer that in two ways. One, that's sort of what Townsend is doing, right? So he's, what he's looking to see is, is is there some insulation between my consumption and my income? And what he's arguing is that in these, in, in Arapala and in Shirapur and Kanzara, it does appear that consumption is mostly uh, insulated from income shocks. Now, there's still a problem here. We can't be sure if this is due to insurance or due to something else. It could be that this is all driven by savings behavior or by um, uh, uh, I guess actually savings behavior is really the only 
good alternative explanation for this in, in uh, except for econometric issues. Um, so if, the, if we take these, if we, if we take these, if we take these uh, estimates at face value, then it's implying that there's a very small correlation between variations in my own income and variations in my consumption. So something's disentangling that. It's gonna be either savings or some form of insurance, okay? Um, however, um, we're not seeing insurance directly here. That's what we're gonna to get to next, okay? Uh, we have another question from Jose. For that basic model, do we need to assume there is no cost to shifting income between states and time? Ah, we have to assume that there's no cost to shifting income across people. And so let's go quickly to this. Um, we're not actually allowing people to, sh we're not allowing the economy as a whole to shift resources between states and times because we're forcing the aggregate consumption in the village to be less than or equal to ag aggregate endowment of the village in that state in that time. However, we are assuming that it's completely costless for me, person I, to, to transfer resources to you, person J, in that state in that time. So these state contingent transfers are completely um, uh, frictionless. There's no transactions cost, and there's no loss in these transfers. So yeah, um, it's a bit crazy. Okay. Okay. Should we go on or is there another? I think maybe we'll take one more for now, just for the sake of time. Uh, so Prasenjit asks, are we assuming that efficient risk implies there's no interdependence in the village? Uh, oh, another great question. Um, uh, in this model, I would say that we are assuming that individuals are selfish. They don't care about anybody else. Okay. But at the same time, there's a vast degree of social interdependence. I'm depending upon you to give me resources when you're doing well and I'm doing badly and vice versa. So there's selfishness, but there's a high degree of interdependence and interaction between individuals in the community. Um, so moving, moving on, what's, what's great about what Townsend has done is he set a very clear, extreme model of, of what efficiency in the sharing of risk within a community looks like. Um, and he's testing the end implication of that. That is, how does the consumption of people in poor villages in India vary over time with their income? Are they able to successfully separate the two so that shocks, risk to your income, doesn't actually affect your consumption very much? And that's what he argues happens. What we don't know from Townsend is, is how that happens. So he knows that consumption fluctuates less than income. He considers the restrictions implied by optimal risk sharing. He rejects full efficiency, but he argues that it provides a surprisingly good benchmark. In fact, there's not that much variation between, there's not that much covariation between my consumption and my income. Okay. So I had a, um, a paper that came at the same question from a completely different direction. I studied a specific mechanism and that's informal loans in Northern Nigeria. Um, and um, I was not interested in insurance. I was looking, I was interested in these, these informal credit markets in Northern Nigeria. And I was focused on other issues entirely. But as I was collecting data and talking to people, they kept telling me that they could not tell me what they were going to repay on their loans. And when they were making loans to somebody else, they kept telling me they couldn't tell me what their borrower would repay them. They, they, they guess kept saying, you know, it's, in, it's up to God, we'll see what I get. Um, it, it was apparent eventually to me after months of discussion with people that they really didn't know what they were going to be repaid or how much they were going to repay. It appeared to be state contingent. Um, it appeared that 
when lenders made loans or when borrowers borrowed money, they didn't know how much they were going to repay. It was going to, it, it depended upon what happened while the loan was outstanding. And so here's the, the, the evidence that I first had of that. I, I, I first noticed that when an adverse shock was received by somebody who was borrowing, <clears throat> they paid back at a lower interest rate. Excuse me. Um, so if a borrower received an adverse shock, they repaid at a lower interest rate. Now that's not crazy. That might just be defaulting on loans, right? It might be, these are averages over many loans. And so it might be that you know, borrowers who have something bad happen to them, just repay less. But what was really interesting was that when a lender had an adverse shock, she got repaid more. Um, and so, so that looked like real state contingency. It looked like there was insurance embedded in these loans. If lenders make a loan to somebody and then they get repaid a lot when something bad happens to the lender, that's not default behavior. That's some sort of real sharing of risk. And so if these loans, in fact, are bundles of arrow de Bruce securities, the kind of, <clears throat> the kind of financial mechanism that Arrow and de Bruce described to achieve credo efficiency and risk allocation, what must we observe? And so I wrote down a model like that. <coughs> and I also reject foolish efficiency. And then I develop a hidden information model to account for that rejection. Okay, so what would be true if these, if these credit markets, if these, if these loans actually supported a Pareto efficient allocation of risk? Well, we could use the same preferences, um, the same kind of preferences as, as, as Townsend does. Um, so write down a model where I'm just maximizing my expected utility of consumption. Um, and so here I'm gonna write down my consumption in my consumption I in state S in period T after a history of states realized up to that point. Um, we're gonna use this history notation later on. Um, the Pareto efficiency implies that my consumption in state S in time T after some history doesn't depend upon the history. It's just gotta, it just has to depend upon the state. And in fact, it just has to depend upon aggregate consumption of that state, right? That's what Townsend showed. My consumption depends only on aggregate consumption at that, in that state. And so if those are implemented in loans, like I observed in Northern Nigeria, it would be something like this. My consumption in state S at time T, after history T minus one, is gonna depend, it's gonna be equal to my income in that state, plus the repayments I receive on loans that I made or took last year. And these are the, this is the crucial state contingency. If, if, if I get a bad shock to income, this repayment is gonna fully offset that. That's gonna, that's gonna make it so that these are the insurance payments. And then these are my insurance purchases for next period. And so that's the way you would implement a Pareto efficient allocation through state contingent loans. And that implies that my own shocks shouldn't affect my borrowing because my shocks are completely taken care of by the loans I took out the year before. And conditional on the village shock, the shock of my partner shouldn't affect repayments to me. Only my shocks should affect repayments to me. Okay. And I can reject both of those implications. And just so in, 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 in this table, I'm just showing that in fact, if my partners had a shock, it does affect how much I'm repaid which means I haven't diversified my loans properly across the village. Okay. So just like Townsend, just like Town, oh, sorry, just like Townsend, I also reject full efficiency, um, but I found lots of, of state contingency. I found lots of insurance, but I reject full efficiency. Okay. So there we're able to see so the, the, the difference between Townsend's and my results is that mine shows a specific mechanism for trying to smooth risk, but it doesn't completely answer the question of whether Pareto efficiency is achieved 
through some other mechanism complementary to these loans. Townsend shows that they don't achieve full Pareto efficiency, but it doesn't show the specific mechanism. So let me give you just one set of depressing results um, because I have to know, I know about them, so I feel a need to share that burden. Um, this comes from a paper that I have with Haruna and Kazianga, which looks at six villages across Burkina Faso, surveyed by Icrasat, those great guys, in the, in the early 1980s, which importantly were some of the worst drought years on record for Burkina Faso. So this is a terrible time in very poor villages in a very poor country. And we use a specification like that of Townsend to see if individual consumption of, of a given household, conditional on a fixed effect for the household and a fixed effect for the village year. This is this is this mu is is the Lagrange multiplier on the village resources at that time. So that's the that's the aggregate consumption of the village. We're just using a fixed effect instead of that average consumption. And we're going to see if individual income at time t gets translated into consumption. Remember, Townsend's main restriction is that this delta is zero. That given the village resources and my fixed effect, there should be no correlation with my income. Sadly, sadly, we find huge effects within these uh, Burkinabe villages. About 40 to 50% of the shocks the idiosyncratic shocks that individuals in Burkina Faso um, receive gets translated straight into their consumption. And so these are very poor people in poor villages who are not able to smooth the idiosyncratic shocks um, in a time when in fact, people are eating so little calories that they're getting thinner in some of these years. It's, 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 it's really, um, it's really depressing. The, 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 the within village sharing network has not been robust enough in these times of drought to achieve its goal of smoothing consumption and protecting your consumption from your income fluctuations. Okay. All right. So every test that I know of that tries to test for the Pareto efficient allocation of risk, rejects. Um, we don't find a Pareto efficient allocation of risk. Although in most cases we find some degree of risk sharing. Um, although we find very little of it in Burkina Faso. But at some level, this null hypothesis is too strict. Um, we've, we've, we've made assumptions um, as in our movement from the definition of Pareto efficiency to our tests. So here's one example of how we've been too strict. Um, oh, actually, let me, let me, before I go on to these more complicated things, let me stop and ask if there's any questions now. Uh, there's just one question. Uh, Saheed asks, what kind of insurance operates in the village? Ah, and so in Northern Nigeria, it was fascinating because the insurance the, um, was of at least two forms. One form was what I discovered in my work on these, this, this credit market. It, it looked just like a regular rural credit market. There were um, individuals within the village would lend money to other individuals in the village and those individuals would pay back. So it looked like just a regular credit market. But in fact, embedded in that credit market were state contingencies where the loan was repaid either at a higher or at a lower rate, depending upon the random shocks received by both the lender and the borrower. And so the insurance was embedded within a credit contract. Now, one of the reasons that that was true, I believe, um, in Northern Nigeria was that it was part of the interpretation of Sharia law, that lending at a fixed interest rate is forbidden. And so one makes a loan, it's more of a, um, uh, a gesture of mutual solidarity and mutual dependence. And by making that transactions, both parties are taking responsibility for each other. And hence 
the repayments depend upon what happens to both of them during the period when the loan is outstanding. Um, so that's, that's one type. There's another type of insurance as well, which I don't measure in, in my data. And so can't say how important it is, but it's informal transfers of food on a daily basis between households. So those are the two main forms of insurance in Northern Nigeria. Okay. Um, okay. The, um, so going from this fairly fundamental implication of full insurance, that is that the ratio of the marginal utilities of consumption between any two people is fixed by their Pareto weights. Um, we, we, we don't observe marginal utilities, right? There's, there's no data on the marginal utility of consumption. So you have to make some assumptions about this to make empirical progress. So you might assume separability across states and time, for example, expected utility maximization, um, or maybe households vary in their risk aversion. Maybe some people are very risk averse, and some people are less risk averse. Um, that's the idea of, of Mauricio Mazoko and Shivsani um, in their 2012 paper, which looks at heterogeneous risk aversion. So here's a graph of marginal utility, which of course we can never observe on the vertical axis and consumption on the horizontal axis. It's just made up numbers. Um, and so here's how marginal utility declines as you consume more and more for household one. And here's the marginal utility declining as consumption increases for household two. Which household is more risk averse? Okay, household one or household two? Okay, household one is more risk averse because household one's marginal utility is declining faster. Okay, so Let's see what the efficient allocation of risk in this economy of two people is. Let's suppose you've got six units of the good to allocate. And suppose the two individuals have equal, equal Pareto weights. Um, then you're gonna give each of them three units of consumption and they're each gonna have marginal utility of one, okay? So that means the ratio of their marginal utilities the ratio of their marginal utilities has to be one, okay? And, and it's always gonna stay equal to one. Okay, so if they have an endowment of six, they each get three. What happens if they have an endowment of less? What happens if the endowment is lower, say 5.75? We know that we can't keep giving them each three, so we have to cut their consumption. But whose consumption is gonna get cut more? Well, the less risk averse guys, consumption is gonna get cut more. Household two, the less risk averse guy is gonna see his consumption fall down to about here. Whereas household one's consumption is gonna fall down to about here. Why that much? Well, because this plus this equals 5.75. And at that level, each of them gets a marginal utility of 1.2. So the ratio of the marginal utilities is still one and we consume the total aggregate endowment of 5.75. But the crucial point is that when consumption reduced, household two, the less risk averse household, saw a bigger drop in consumption than household one. Similarly, if they have a great year and they have a big endowment within the village, household two gets a lot more and household one gets a little bit more but they both achieve the same marginal utility. So the ratio of marginal utilities remains the same, okay? So if there's heterogeneity and risk aversion, then the less risk averse person is gonna take on a bigger share of the um, variation in aggregate consumption. If that's true, that could bias the tests that we've been using to test for Pareto efficiency. and could cause us to reject Pareto efficiency, even though it's true. Okay. To see that, think of the standard test. Um, the standard test has got consumption of household I at time T on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, it has a fixed effect for that individual's Pareto weight. 
another fixed effect for the village resources, okay, the, 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 the marginal cost of, of resources in that state. Um, and then your own income. And if, and if, if your own income, if, if Y is your own income, we take Delta being positive as an indication of risk sharing failure, right? You haven't fully insured your risk if, if conditional on the amount of village resources, your own income is correlated with your consumption. But there's an omitted variables bias problem in this equation if there's heterogeneity and risk aversion. Because the right-hand side should include an, another variable, EIT, which is the extra variation in household consumption that is not captured by new VT. So the extra consumption change of household two in this slide, okay? We've got an increase in consumption due to the average endowment. So it's gone, it's gone from three to, to, to 6.45 divided by two, whatever that is, it's gone to here. But person two's consumption hasn't gone from three to there. It's gone from three all the way up to here. There's some extra variation in person two's consumption. And so that this is, this is omitted. We've, this, this is something that's gonna be correlated with consumption that we haven't taken into account. And if, so suppose that, suppose that resources are better in, um, period T plus one than T. So just like I showed you on that graph, suppose the village has got more resources than they did before. Then if I is less risk averse than J, I is gonna have a bigger E in period T than J because J is more risk averse. So it increases its consumption less, whereas I is gonna increase its consumption by more. If at the same time, less risk averse households have income that is more correlated with village resources, then the covariance of mu VT and YIT is gonna be positive. This is, this is more risk averse guys are gonna have a higher, um, are gonna have higher income in periods when the village has higher income. Then that's gonna to lead to a, a covariance between E and Y that's positive. So when we, when we estimate delta, the expected value of delta hat is gonna be equal to delta plus the covariance of this, which is positive. So we're going to reject Pareto efficiency, even though the allocation was Pareto efficient because the person with the higher income is getting higher consumption because they're less risk averse. So if that's true, our tests fail. Okay. So how would we test it? We can compare every pair of households, person I and person J. Here's the more risk averse person. Here's the less risk averse person. This is aggregate consumption in the village. And this is how the optimal risk sharing consumption is for person one and person two. It could be the case that they're not, that, that they're, they're not, looking like they move together, one could be steeper than the other um, because of this risk, um, the, because person one is taking on more risk than person two. This finding won't reject risk aversion. This could be just because um, this doesn't, this doesn't, sorry, this doesn't reject Pareto efficiency. It rejects common risk aversion. Um, person two is fluctuating less than person one, not because they haven't shared risk fully, but because person one is willingly taking on the extra risk. Um, but it's still the case that person one's consumption has to be monotonic in, how, in village consumption. The finding, if we find that person one's consumption actually goes down when village consumption goes up, that violates the basic condition here, okay? Because th what that means is that person one's consumption was going up while person two's consumption was going down, which means this ratio can't be holding constant, okay? So it's still possible to test, but our specific tests 
can often be misleading. Okay, I'm going to uh, step back and think about what we've done in the last hour. What is concerning? Who cares about whether we reject full risk sharing? Of course we reject full risk sharing. Any notion that any economy fully achieves a Pareto efficient allocation over anything is, 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 is wrong if you've got good enough data. Um, if with good enough data, we can find deviations from pure efficiency. Um, and so we shouldn't really care about these tests so much. What we care about is the magnitude of the deviation. How badly are our institutions doing relative to what they could do in principle? There's other things that we should care about that are first order that we haven't talked about at all yet. The definition of the community, who's sharing risk with whom? Many of these studies just take the village as a natural level of risk sharing. It doesn't necessarily have to be the village. It could be social networks more, that are more complex. It could be families. It could be work groups. It could be lots of other different sets of people who are sharing risk together. Um, the functional form we don't care about. Um, we have to worry about endogenous income. We'll talk about that a little bit in a few minutes. Um, we have to worry about heterogeneous preferences, like I just said. I care a lot about households where, where um, all of this literature has looked at household to household risk sharing and not talked about what's going on within the household, whether individuals within this household are, are being insured or whether the household as a whole is being insured and, and so on and so on. We're gonna get, I'm gonna get to some more details in a second. Um, so there's a very large literature building on this first wave of studies of, of, of Townsend's work. There's work that talks about limited commitment and how people have to be, under what conditions do people voluntarily stay in risk sharing arrangements. There's work on imperfect information, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. There's some work looking at different groups, different risk sharing groups. And we think it's really important to look at specific mechanisms like I tried to do in Northern Nigeria that Marcel Fauchamp has done, that Mark Rosen's wife has done with Andrew Foster. Um, um, and so, but what we've got so far is that it looks like there's a great deal of insurance in many rural communities. It seems to be relatively effective, perhaps for idiosyncratic short-term risk in some contexts, but never is unconstrained Pareto efficiency achieved. Okay, I'm gonna pause for questions and then I'm gonna talk for 10 minutes about some of the real barriers to insurance. Okay, any questions? Yes, we have three questions. Uh, the first is, in times of drought, aren't all farmers experiencing similar aggregate shock rather than idiosyncratic shock? Yes, yes, that's really important. Uh, in Burkina Faso, everybody was doing bad. And so we expected consumption to go down. So the results I showed you were actually Given that everybody's doing badly, who in the village is doing relatively less badly and who's doing more badly? And that's what we're looking for insurance against. So even though everybody's suffering, there is heterogeneity in the degree of suffering. And what we're finding is that the people who were suffering most did not get helped by those who were suffering a little bit less. But the fact that it took place in, the, in this period of drought is really important. And I think, um, it's a reflection of the stress that the drought put on the insurance network that led to it breaking down. Okay. okay, Nadia asks, are there any papers you would recommend on the zero interest Sharia loans in North Nigeria? Ah, I won't give you an example of a paper, but send me an email and I'll give you a couple of citations to books. Um, uh, Michael Watts has a wonderful book, a geographer at at Berkeley. Okay, the last question for now. Uh, how can can Tanzan's models explain the rate of farmer suicide in India? Oh. Um, so Townsend's model and argument would would I think have it would be a stretch to, to actually take it seriously for thinking about farmer suicide. Um, I think that's I think that's too deep a, a question for me probably. Um, in principle, if there was good insurance, people wouldn't face as much stress. 
maybe things will be better, but I, I don't I don't have enough expertise to really say about that. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I, I actually have some questions for this. Sorry. Yeah. Continue. Okay. I actually have I have some recent work in, in in Ghana on cognitive behavioral therapy and depression amongst the poor, and how much it can help in the short run. But it, even that is, is 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 not I think enough to deal with issues as deep as suicide. Okay, so um, there's good reasons to expect that we're not going to be able to achieve a fully efficient um, pooling of risk within any specific community for lots of reasons, some sort of standard economic reasons like moral hazard. Um, thank you, Felipe Beretti, um, one of my PhD students at Northwestern, who found these great comics for me. Um, who used them in one of his presentations. Um, so moral hazard is a standard reason why we don't achieve um, full insurance. The model that we had was an endowment economy. It didn't have any actual production. So suppose that you actually have to put an effort to achieve um, a good outcome for your, for your income. And so let the probability of state S be a function of the effort that's exerted by everybody in the, in the community. If, and if, if effort is unobserved and it's costly, there's incentive compatibility constraints that must be satisfied. You can't achieve full risk sharing. If higher levels of effort increase the probability of states with high incomes relative to the probability of states with low incomes, that's, what, that's how we think effort works. If you work hard, you're more likely to get a good Y. You're more likely to get good income. Um, if that's true, then high income realizations, if you do get high income, that's a signal of high effort. So you should be rewarded. So to encourage high effort, the Pareto planner rewards households with high income by giving them higher consumption. And that means insurance is incomplete. Um, if you get high income, you have relatively high consumption. If you have low income, you have relatively low consumption. So moral hazard implies you can't achieve complete risk sharing. You have to have some reward to having high income to achieve high effort. So that's a standard argument. And it's, and it's if there's moral hazard, unobserved effort, um, we wouldn't expect to see full risk pooling. Okay. Similarly, um, if um, somebody looking forward in their life thinks that they could be better off without participating in mutual insurance than by participating, we have a problem of limited commitment. People might leave the risk sharing um, uh, equilibrium if they can do better by themselves. And this I think might be part of what happened in Burkina Faso. So in some states of nature, suppose my own income is much, much higher than the amount of consumption that I would get in the risk sharing equilibrium. You know, everybody else in the village did badly. There's a drought. I didn't do so badly. And so my income is high relative to the average in the, in the village. And so if we were sharing risk, I'd have to be getting a lot of my income to other people in the village to share my relatively good fortune. Okay. Um, if that's true and I am tempted to exit the risk sharing arrangement, maybe I can exit. Maybe I can stop participating. Um, in fact, if there's a finite T, then it's, our standard models would imply that this is guaranteed to happen. You need future participation to all, at all times in order to, to maintain participation. Um, and hence, you have to have limited commitment constraints that we satisfy. The, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go through this equation. Um, but full risk sharing, again, will generally not be achievable. Agents with high income realizations have to receive higher rewards to keep them from reneging, to keep them, to keep them participating, um, um, so they're not tempted to leave. Okay. Um, similarly, if I can hide my income, that also uh, tends to force risk sharing to break down. And then there's the possibility of adverse selection, in which, uh, for example, if people offered insurance um, against uh, bad farming outcomes 
I might apply for it because I'm a lousy farmer and I know I'm gonna receive lots of insurance payments. But probably more important than these information problems are the more mundane problems like transactions costs. It actually takes time and effort to transfer these resources. There's the possibility of fraud. There's the need for trust. Um, there's, there's something called basis risk, which is, which is that you might get insured against things that are observable, but those things that are observable may not be strongly correlated with what you actually need. And then there are severe limits on the scope and duration of viable insurance programs. That, yeah, I, that, that the transactions costs and the, and the trust necessary to maintain exchanges of promises can't take place over the whole globe or over a long enough period of time in order to deal with some of these wide aggregate shocks and long duration shocks um, that are particularly difficult to ensure. Okay, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop there and answer a couple questions and then we'll close up. Uh, I think we're all out of questions. We don't have Excellent. any anymore. Great. So thank you, everybody. We've got um, Abhijit Banerjee coming up tomorrow to tell you about credit markets, and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs>